obviously, huge shout out to the guys here. This place is absolutely freaking awesome. First time I've ever been here. Wandered down to the seashore and two very nice old ladies asked me why I was in a skirt. <laughs> Bless their little cotton socks. <laughs> um, obviously, huge shout out for the guys and you can blame the guys for me being here. Um, come in, get a seat. This is like Southwest Airlines. Make friends with somebody to the left and the right of you. I'm very familiar with Southwest because it's the only fucking airline I can fly these days. <laughs> um, we will have a talk about deception, hide and seek. We're going to have some fun with nanotechnology. I tried cramming cows in here, but I didn't have enough time. Because as I pointed out to the guys that were in here earlier, I am the only thing standing between you and free stuff and alcohol. So we're going to do 70 slides in as fast as we can bloody well get through them. We will not be talking about airplanes. We will not be talking about the federal authorities because I spent 26 winding them up again. Second part of mouse, second part of housekeeping. Um, I'm obviously with the Calvio. We obviously do deception technology and a bunch of other stuff. This is not a bloody sales pitch. If it becomes one, throw things at me. Um, this really, I hate people who use freaking this forum as a presentation and as a sales pitch. Shoot them. Um, for any of you that are looking at deception tech or any actually technology that's coming out in 2017 and beyond, start using some of these criteria. Um, we're going to look at the ugly stuff and you know, tribute to Freddie Mercury in the world. So, recap of the current state. Why are we having these discussions? And yes, there's some. F Can you guys at the back read the little small script on the bottom? Well, then come up to the front. <laughs> All right, come on, get, get a bloody seat for crying out loud. You make the place look untidy. All right, so let's take a look at where we are today. 90% or greater of attacks against your systems, these very nice toys that you are coding and making and that I keep breaking, are known exploits. We're not talking about advanced persistent threats or any of that shit or zero days or anything. This is stuff that's already out there. The whole BYOD, everything that we're looking at these days. I mean, we know it's not going away. You guys are building some amazing things. The problem is we're breaking it faster than you're building it. The migration to the cloud in all of its wonders and all of its challenges and all of its issues. Obviously, more services are on that. I'll look at what we're doing. We're dropping a bunch of stuff on onto the cloud. But we're doing it in what we would classify as an organized and secure manner not like a charging herd of rhinoceros going, woohoo, it's the cloud, it's something new to play with. Which unfortunately seems to be what a lot of enterprises are still bloody doing. They take the data which they don't fully understand what they have, let alone the classification level of it. They shovel it up there as fast as they can, not understanding who owns the cloud, who manages it, who secures it, what the hell they're doing with it, and then they wonder why they still get their ass handed to them. The big thing that we're still, I mean, we've been, what's DEF CON in these days? 25, 26, 25 years, we've been stood up on stage talking about security, let alone all the days we were getting chased by the bloody feds before we even became organized. And yet 20 plus years later, so many organizations still do not have an organized security program. So many organizations, the startup communities here, San Jose, Colorado, and all the other next, it was like, well, we'll just build it and we'll figure it out afterwards. That shit's got to stop. And the big nasty one, 75% of IoT manufacturers will not be able to address the issue. Well, what issue are we talking about it? All of the damn stuff. Every, a, a friend of mine's like, oh, I've got a new crock pot and it's IoT. I wanted to shoot it and then him. Why the hell do you need a freaking IoT crockpot? Well, it's cool. I can start it up from home. Well, so can I. And I can have it abuse your fridge, which is abusing the microwave, which denial of services attack your wireless. Sound familiar? Let alone the cars and everything else that we're building this technology into. And then to add everything onto this, we're letting it loose on the general population. Approximately, by 2020, 4 billion people 25 million apps out there. So we're on what, 2017 now? Three years and change, we're gonna have all of this apps. And let's face it, 24,999,000 of the damn things won't be coded securely. It is an ever-increasing playground for the likes of us, the red teaming guys, the purple teaming, the attackers, the hackers. And yet we keep shoveling all this stuff up here. And we still keep putting the onus on the poor user. 
which if we look at the math, isn't the best thing to do either. So let's take a look at this. Four billion connected people in 2020. It's a lot of people. And we can dispute those numbers, but it's going to be a lot. If you take the standard bell curve by, unfortunately, which most of us are measured by, we have about 15% get security. We have 70% of them who follow the herd. Sheeple. And then we have 15% can't spell security. Or they're in the top, I'm going to use LinkedIn, I'm apologizing about this. You know that top 20 passwords from bloody LinkedIn? And there were, what, two and a half million people in that top 20? And the most complicated password was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I was like, well, that's great. It's an eight character password. It's perfect. We trust these people to actually secure their systems. America, about 4.5% of the global population. This was before Trump got into power. It's probably down to about 4% now. <laughs> Sorry. We will have more of those as we go through this. 26.5 million people is about 8% of the US population. So if you break the math down, at most, 8% of the population that you are targeting with your new shiny toys will have a chance of understanding security. <laughs> and Rudy Giuliani is not in that 8%. <laughs> I couldn't help it. <laughs> I mean, this is what we're looking at. It's just, I mean, it's not going to end well. Not if we keep going the same way. Summary on it, we're adding complex technology. We're handing the technology to a population that's challenged at best. My mother, for crying out loud, still calls me up for tech support. She's 5,000 miles away from where I currently am standing. Christopher, I just got this new thing, and it tells me, oh, God help us. Thankfully, I backdoored her computer, and I can get into the stupid thing and fix it. How many of us face those situations with the families that we have, let alone everybody that we're selling these things to? We're integrating the technology into our homes, our offices. We couldn't take care of the data when it was locked in the four walls of our companies. We only just managed to take care of it when it was in the mainframes back in the 80s and 90s. And the only reason we could take care of the shit is there was a man on the door that would shoot you unless you had the right color card. Since then, we've lost control of the data. Yet we still don't protect it properly. We don't necessarily always have the in-house knowledge and the understanding to look after our own systems, let alone the ones that we're dispersing to everybody else. We don't necessarily have the resources, unfortunately. And we don't really have good eyes on our own systems. <laughs> I love this one. We use this regularly. We will send out, when we're doing red teaming, we'll send out healthcare websites. Well, welcome to the new healthcare website. We're actually good. We're helping your company by giving you advanced information on your healthcare solution. And they're like, brilliant. And we're like, because we're so helpful, we're actually hooking it up to your Active Directory. So all you have to do is put your user ID and password into this little box. 85 or greater percent hit rate. Go, oh, it says employee login. Shit, I must put it in there. Game over. We own you. End of discussion. And kind of, you know, this is how we are. Aha, say the vendors. How many vendors do we have in from downstairs, by the way, before I just abuse them all? Because the vendors go, we've got blinky lights for you. And they will solve everything. Good gods, firewalls, we've got a new firewall for you. It's called Next Generation IPS. I think Cisco has coined that, NGIPS. Have any of you seen the blurb on that shit? They took the firewalls from 2015s and the IDIPS, they put the 2018 purple blinky light in it, put new marketing blurb around it, and are selling it. We went past those 10, 15 years ago, very quickly. All of the DLP, for crying out loud, you can, you can circumvent, obfuscate past DLP. This stuff's easy to break. You've got more blinky lights. You should have policies, procedures, controls. I'm not going to ask how many of you have them, because I don't want to have uh, so few hands in the air, because I would imagine there will be. So many organizations we walk into to do assessments and consultative engagements with, let alone breaking into the buggers. 
We actually go, hi, so what policies do you have for acceptable use policy for little Johnny over there using his home computer on your corporate network? Well, you know, we're a trusting environment. Great, I'm going to taser Johnny until you put an acceptable use policy in place. <laughs> I just walked into one... Where was I? I was in North Carolina. Monday, I walk in. The guy's sitting there with his computer. I'm like, hey, that's a nice one. It doesn't seem to match any of the others. He's like, well, I'm using my computer because they said I could. I'm like, what happens if you get run over by a bus? Well, you know, it's my computer. My family get it. I'm like, fuck that. It's got my core data on it. It's mine. I'm buying it from you now. We cut him a check in the afternoon. He kept his toy that he liked, but it became my toy. Simple solutions. Security event log monitoring. Great, wonderful product, as long as you've got 24 pairs of eyes watching it 24 by 7 by 365, which we probably don't have. And this one annoys the hell out of me. You get a pen test. No, you don't. Most of you just get an assessment by somebody who runs a set of predetermined tools. I, had, I don't know who I was talking to down in the bloody munchies line earlier on today. By the way, munchies were good. Thank you. But somebody was like, oh, you need to use more than one tool. No shit, Sherlock. If any pen tester comes to you and says, oh, I'm going to run Nessus, taser the bastard. Seriously. I'm like, for God's sakes. I was on site the other week. And they're like, oh, we had a certain company. I'm not going to say it. I really want to say it, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I will. Um, it was fucking, it was Trustwave. I walked in there like, oh, we had a pen test. It was 11 pages long. They scanned uh, 20 slash 24, so 250 odd addresses. They scanned it for four weeks and didn't find shit. Of the 11 page report, nine pages were marketing. One page said that we didn't find anything and one page had screenshots. I could have shot them. Let alone the fact it's a complete disservice to the client. It puts us in a stupid ass light. So when you actually want somebody to come in and break your systems, preferably before you've released them to the public, preferably at a stage where you can make adjustments, because we're not nice. We find all sorts of nasty things, because that's our job. Get somebody who knows what the hell they're doing, please. I don't care if we're bringing people up through the ranks. We all have to do that. But if you have the junior guy, have the crazy bearded old 40-year-old guy who swears all the time with him. Don't get the Deloitte and Two Special where you get the two green guys behind the ears who've got the CISSP called Paper Tigers. <laughs> Told you this was going to be a bit of a rant, didn't I? By the way, um, the slides will be available. I'm going to give them, this, them to this man here so you'll have them up on the website and all the other stuff. Auditors. I actually feel sorry for auditors these days because they come on site. It's an adversarial, unfortunately, it's an adversarial relationship. Oh, God, the auditors here. Which room can we put them in? How little can we tell them? And how can we get away with everything? Not good. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to take a step back. It was a good conversation. The, the password one that was in the other building, the, the gentleman that was up on stage made a very simple statement, which was, assume the fact that the bad guys are in your network. I want somebody to argue against me on that one because I don't think it's, I don't think it's possible. The chances of you stopping me or anybody of my ilk or better than me not getting to the first computer is about zero. Because between the chair and this nice piece of electronics that you have is the squishy 200 pound lump of human. And we are the worst thing invented on this planet for security. Because as geeks, we like cheap stuff or free stuff or 15% off coupons for pizza. As HR, we love to get resumes that are payloaded. As legal and compliance, we obviously get stuff from the DOJ in a PDF that we obviously have to open up, which is payloaded. And I'll send you to as many free things as I possibly can. Somebody's going to click something, or I'm going to get credentials. You cannot stop me, and I'm happy to argue this over alcohol afterwards, you cannot stop me from getting to the first computer. And that's where the challenge comes in, because so much blinky shit that we sell, 
is trying to convince you that you can. But you can't unless we take the human out of the equation. The other nasty thing that's against you, you have to be right every single time. Every single action you take as a defender has to be 100%. And you've got to get lucky once. Some dingleberry who has access from development into production posts something. It's never happened before and opens up a web page, portal, port, or something, and you know damn well it's going down. So, let's have a recap. So, what does my computer want to do about it? There we go. Let's take a little bit of fun. We'll take a step back, we'll stop beating up on ourselves, and we'll have some fun, because um, this is fun stuff. One of the nice things I get to do with a Calvio is take the, the proverbial crystal ball and chuck it out five or ten years out to see what happens. <laughs> so we're going to have some fun. You think you've got problems now with the computers and the IoT and the ICS and all the other fun stuff? Yeah, we've got nothing yet. This is where it gets really freaky and really fun. And this is something for you guys to think about. Part of my job here isn't just to make you give you some leaving thoughts but it's to make you guys think, where are you going to be in 5, 10, 15 years' time? What technologies are going to be out there? Not codes, what languages, or any of that stuff. Where are you guys going to want to focus in, in that amount of time? For us, we're taking a long, hard look at the nanotechnology stuff. Why? Because it's fun. Because you're able to target humans directly. Stop breaking into the equipment. We're not talking about breaking into defibrillators or the um, insulin pumps or anything else like this. We're talking about getting into humans directly. <laughs> I love my squirrels. We've got to have a fun squirrel picture. So what are we talking about? We're talking about single molecular carbon-based computing. Quick question. Is anybody in, that, in this field that's sitting in the audience? Or anybody interested in this field? Or should I just skip over the whole damn thing for fun and games? All right, we'll have some fun with this one. So this is kind of cool stuff, about a nanometer, so really small. We've got a picture on this stuff. And you can make them do all sorts of interesting things. At the molecular level, they're one, oops, sorry, they're one of the strongest and stiffest and hardest and all sorts of thermal kind of cool stuff. But the fun thing is, is it's like Lego. You can take these individual nanomolecules and you can build simple machines out of them. Now, first, you've got to manufacture the buggers, which is a challenge. So on the left, there's a nanotube array. Now, 10 years ago, those buggers were expensive to produce. Now, they're cents for grams of the damn things. The cost has come down so much because the usage has shot up over the last few years. And if you look at the size of the critters, that entire nano array is 1 8,000th or something of a human hair. And then we start looking at what we can do with them. We can make simple machines. So they released this. EPFL's lab released this. So it's now a couple of months ago because I did this. I did this slide, I think, back at Gurkhan in September, October time frame. And since then, they've now had these simple machines at a stage. Each one of those is a set of carbon tubes that's actually forming itself into letters, numbers, and sequences. The individual tubes can now do addition, multiplication, subtraction, and a few other things. We can interface with these things because we can actually get into the coding of them. We can actually code from our coding systems that we use here into an electromagnetic spectrum into these things. So we can now make them do all sorts of nice letters and imprint on humans and all sorts of fun things. Simple stuff. Go out, do some research. Verilog does a circuit function on these things. It's just fun, easy, simple stuff. We can actually specify whether the carbon tubes that we're building are actuators, sensors. We can literally make them into little processing chips. It's kind of fun stuff. Um, CelloCat has a really, really cool program. If you guys are interested in this, CelloCat does some really, really interesting stuff on this one. And you can basically build a set of algorithms that you can imprint on these and then drop them into whatever you want, fruits and vegetables. Or, I love this one. How many of you don't know XKCD? Oh, this is awesome. I love it. Yeah, we all love it. Let's face it. I have that t-shirt. <laughs> 
This is coding into biology. So on the left-hand side, we start inputting code over here. We start basically dropping it out into the same kind of code that we recognize. You have user constraint files. It parses it, synthesizes it, does a gate assignment, and drops it out into a frequency wave. So my source code that I've spent the last couple of weeks building, I can drop into a frequency generator. I can drop it onto, e I can drop it onto, well, in this case, we use E. coli. We can drop it onto sari and bird flu, bird flu and a few other things. And now we've got to deploy it. We've got it on our nanochips. We've got it on everything else. Now we figure out how the hell we deploy it. That isn't reality. This, however, is reality. Top left-hand side is actually nanobots that have been built to swim in the human blood system. The cool side about these things from a medicinal standpoint, it's freaking awesome. You start taking a look at what you're designing today, what you are building, and you scale it down to a molecular level, imagine the applications that you can build and you can design. That stuff's built. This is science fact, not fiction we're dissing around with. The same thing, we can now get them to code. Now, there's some good and some bad with this. You can't ingest them yet through breathing. Emphasis on the word yet. Thankfully, the body's got all sorts of barriers between blood and brain and breathing and blood and all sorts of other things. They are working on breaking those barriers down. Kind of scares me a little bit, because these buggers are kind of small. You have no clue if you breathe them in or what the hell's going on. But yeah, it is what it is. So, the upside, the cool stuff they're looking at doing them. So you talk about deployment architectures. And again, you look at where you guys are today, look at where you're building, look at where you're deploying, and then look at it from the attacker's perspective. Where am I going to focus? Drug delivery capabilities. Focusing on therapy. One of the biggest things on these, on the positive side, is we've been able to target, say we, they've been able to target cancer cells. Now they're targeting them at the moment so that the dot can go in and beat the crap out of the damn thing with lasers and stuff. But eventually they're building them so that they can payload. No different than a virus that we build today in the electronic world. When I come in and I payload an attack, and 12 hours later I get a reverse shell or your entire database comes over to my Tor node. Diagnostics, microbiome, dental practices for crying out loud, for whatever reason, we are fairly fascinated with having white teeth in this country. And for that, they're looking at using all sorts of nano architectures for that. So enough theory. Let's have some fun. Here's the hack that we did. Um, we've actually done a few others since then, but I am not releasing them publicly because I'm already scaring enough people with this stuff. We took a receptor. We took our transport. We took our ribozines, we took an image reporter, we took the drug, and we took a disruptor. The whole concept here, with a regular body, in order to inject it with a vaccine, you have to fool it into a state of like, oh, I want to introduce you. So you take something like bird flu, which is fairly nasty, you neutralize it, and then you let the body deal with it. And in doing so, it brings it into the fold of the body. So you fool it by putting a receptor on there which fools it. You put the reporting module that says, hey, I've managed to get in there. And what you end up doing is we took bird flu, put it onto multi ward nanotubes. We did exactly what a vaccine does, a regular normal vaccine that people tend to get. We fooled the body and going, hey, this is a good thing, and it ingested it in. We have the propulsion system. You guys saw that two slides back, where things swam up the blood system. We have a decoys in case the antibodies in the body go, holy crap, what the hell have I just had in there? which is no different than we try to do with the static equipment that we have these days. And if we're playing nice, we kill cancer cells. In the case that we went through, we played not nice, and we delivered an attack payload to the red blood cells. At which point it goes, Bleh! which makes life interesting as well. Now, this isn't expensive to do. About 100 bucks worth of equipment. 
Arduinos, sensors, and a couple of other bits of communications. I can now communicate with the nano architecture that we've put in the body. I don't need a truck load or a lorry load in this. No, what is it in this country? Lorries, trucks? Trucks. Whatever. I don't need a big articulated lorry load of crap to actually attack you. <laughs> I've got $100 worth of frickin' open source architecture. I can now communicate with the nanotech that's sitting inside of you. And by the way, in case anybody's got, oh, it's, we're back in the science fiction. We're already looking at putting it into agriculture to deliver pesticides. We think we've got problems now with GMO and crap. Yeah, we see nothing. The ability to basically drop into food processing. They're freaking out over this one, so no longer will your bananas only last two weeks. The buggers will keep going for months, for crying out loud. And Twinkies? Good gods, Twinkies will outlast the planet. Food packaging, supplements. I mean, I used, I'd still take supplements every now and again, but I mean, it's a standard theorem. You take vitamin C and you pee most of it out inside the first couple of hours. Not this way. It will bind to the necessary molecules in the body. Come on in. Get an axle inspector. Welcome. So, good old XKCD again. Best case scenario in the next five to 15 years. Target your cure for cancer. Freaking awesome if we can get that shit right. Blood clots, all sorts of things with Alzheimer's and everything else. Pretty bloody awesome. For those of you that are sitting there going, hmm, I'm not happy with what I'm doing in my app dev, my app architecture, or whatever. Start looking at this stuff, because it's pretty freaking awesome. However, if we don't get our shit together, we have a bit of a worst case scenario. Targeted attacks. Could you imagine encoding a targeted attack? It'd be hilarious or destructive. The secure facilities. How many of you guys have worked in SCIFs or have had to deal with SCIFs? I won't ask, actually, because it means putting a hand up and all that good stuff. Let's not declare who's got clearances. Anyway, you securing the SCIF? That shit ain't happening ever again. Because now I have the capability to basically drop an architecture into you, which can not only monitor, it can retain, and it can relay. And you have no clue what's going on. You're basically nothing more than a human version of a USB stick. Have a nice day. <laughs> Yeah, this one I love. You know, let's do the American paranoia. Oh, let's weaponize it. Whoops, a daisy. Sorry, we we give it to the crazy head. What is he? Orange head? Oh, by the way, Madame Two Swords just had, did a wax of him. They used yak hair to duplicate his hair. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> we think we have problems now. I did a paper a while ago just for shits and giggles. Um, most of you, I'm assuming, have seen Terminator version 1, 2, 3, 5, 4, 6, whatever the hell they're up to these days. Does anybody actually follow the timeline on that bloody movie? I did, a, I did a whole thing a while ago, basically saying that Skynet was right. That we are probably our own worst enemy. This is likely to prove it if we don't get this shit right. Obviously, temperature and electromagnetic weapons become basically the weapons of the day, let alone $100 worth of Audrinos. So, you know, and then we take the other option, which is, hey, we all live for a long time. Well, that's great. The Earth struggling as it is with 7 mil billion of us. So, yeah, um, hmm, challenged. Again, <laughs> not for the first time. So, now that we've sown despair and all the other stuff, let's see what the hell we can do about it. I get a second to actually have a quick drink. I love my squirrels, for those of you who've never seen me present before. So, what do we do? How do we actually fix the problem? How do we not just fix the problem on the nano architecture, but how do we fix it for the days that we are living in today? We'll take an adage from packet storms years. Evolve or die. The tools that information security puts out these days have to evolve. The day of the static purple blinky piece of shit that gets put in a rack has to be numbered. Stop buying it. Why? Because it has to autonomously learn the environment it's in. I had some questions for some people down there, and they're like, oh, we do predictive. I'm like, no, you don't. It's a fucking signature. That's not predictive. That's antivirus from, what, 1980s? 
Hello, they've called and they want their programs back. It needs to adapt. It needs to emulate. Learning behavior needs to be built in. We talk about the ability to do... How many of you have heard of user behavior analytics, UBA? Good God's alive. We can't control the bloody users. Most of the time we have no clue what the hell they're doing. Half the bloody time we want to shoot them, taser them, or both. How the hell can you do user behavior analytics when you can't even baseline the buggers? Build an architecture that can learn rather than trying to baseline something you cannot control. Build something that could be physical or virtual or in the cloud. Again. I get fed up when we see point solutions. I can protect you in the cloud. Well, what if I've got an on-premise? Well, um, I can put it in a 2U rack. Bullshit. Give me something that's adaptive. Security's got to evolve. Until we start seeing preventative, predictive, and actual intelligence-based systems, we're not going to stand a chance of winning. And it's got to be flipping intuitive. My God, I mean, the poor guys who are actually trying to look after the very systems that we have. That's cool. I like the ringtone on that. <laughs> Do you want to answer? Hey, can I answer it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything we've got to build has got to be predicted. Has got to have a look. For crying out loud, when you are designing the next sodding widget that you are designing and you want to let it loose on the mass population, I want two thoughts out of you. Oh shit, the six foot three hairy guy with a goatee is going to beat the crap out of it. And God help us, his mother's going to get hold of it. If it doesn't satisfy those rules, don't release it. And if your CTO still wants to overrule you, Give me his telephone number. <laughs> Freaking love that squirrel. Please hold. All right, some more ways that we have to evolve. If I see another security product, that means I have to have eyes not just in the front of my head, but the back of my head, the side of my head, and six consoles in front of me, so I look like my own little centralized NSA system, I'm going to shoot somebody. If your GUI sucks so badly that I can do command line instructions more effectively and efficiently, you've failed. I think, what the hell was the last one? I was, it's bloody Cisco probably again. Whether it's Windows or Cisco, when PowerShell's better than the GUI and command line's coming back into phase, we've got problems. If it takes a month to roll out and comes with an instruction booklet, I got one of these sodding, what the hell, the Arlo's, the Netf Net Netflix, Netgear Arlo's. It, the I didn't bother reading the stupid thing, I just had fun with it. The bloody instruction book's like this thick for installing this stupid thing. I'm like, my God, I'm giving it to my mother. As you are building your systems, factor in the fact that leadership still has issues. For whatever the hell reason, they are happy to throw money at shiny things, but they're not happy to throw money at the bodies that need to support it. Let alone the fact that they'll buy it, but they won't buy support, they won't buy installation, the buggers won't buy maintenance. Change that paradigm. Help them understand why that paradigm needs to change. <laughs> That's fun with this one. <laughs> Size does matter. I hate, personally, I actually hate the cloud. I appreciate it, and I understand it, but I hate it with a passion because so many people don't go into it with their eyes open. They're like, oh, it's going to put all of our data up there. It'll be perfectly happy with all the default passwords and crap that they had on their own systems and then wonder why not only can the guys locally break the heck out of it, but so can everybody else. If, when you deploy your system, we have to put an entire rack of gear, and I'm going on deception here, because deception annoys the hell out of me. Because you've got the guys like, oh, I can build you a new, uh, deception is Honeypot Mark II. We'll have that discussion. So if you're going to build a deceptive model where you have to roll in an entire rack of hardware, you've failed. If you build a solution where I have to find space 
for an entire chassis of VMs, you failed. If the solution basically means I have to double up my budget for my flipping fi for my uh, pipe out to the internet, you failed. You have not adapted to the architectures that you are targeting. And if I have to open up another bloody LDAP service account just so your crap can actually work properly, you failed. All right, another quick scroll moment. This was what I was like this morning. I finished working yesterday at about 9, 10 o'clock, got about two hours of sleep until about 11.30 last night the alarm went off. Worked until 4.30 this morning when the alarm went off that I should have gotten up to go to the airport to get my ass here. So that was what I was like when I got to the airport this morning. I'm like, <gasps> need a cup of tea, need a cup of tea, need a cup of tea. Okay, the other one that drives me nuts. That as developers and as architects and as solution type people, you have to take into consideration. If you are building something, it should be portable. I should be able to walk into a healthcare location in the same way I can walk into manufacturing, retail, financial, or whatever, and I should be able to deploy it. I should be able to take these solutions, especially security solutions, and deploy them in any vertical bloody market I want to. If you turn around and say your solution is enterprise only, I'm going to taser you. Because so much of the crap that we're dealing with is industrial control systems, is IoT, smart, SCADA, the whole bloody lot. Including all of our data. One of the biggest issues that we still have. Perfect conversation with the, the password chap was simple. It's simple. The data isn't just sitting in the data center. It's not just sitting in the one SQL table that you hope it's in there. Because Mary from finance has downloaded some bits of it. Fred from accounting has got some of it. Half the bloody IT guys have probably got access to the stupid thing. And some dingleberry in development decided that they needed permissions in UAT and also flip in production. Because they were a special snowflake. With the same user ID and the same sodding password. It's got to stop. And this is the big stuff. Security cannot be an afterthought in when you're building stuff. This is almost a plea from me. 10 minutes? Gotcha. I think I'm getting there. We're actually doing pretty good. Ish. <laughs> Security can't be something that you remember after QA. I still work in a, I do a bunch of stuff with a bunch of startups. And I will sit down and have nice conversations with the guys that are holding the coins and the purses and the money and say, hi, if you build it insecurely, I will be the one that puts it out on the internet as being insecure. Whether you like it or you don't like it, get the shit fixed before it hits the streets. We have enough problems with the stuff that we're putting out there without adding more to it. Security can't be left out because of budget issues. You know, what? if you've got to take one less free lunch and the free Cokes that you get and all the other flipping perks, Maybe those get scaled back a little bit because you can actually secure the damn thing. Take one for the team, please. Security is a mindset. It's simple. 2017 already belongs to us. Change the paradigm. It's a differentiator as well. And it's our responsibility. Because if it's not to the responsibility of everybody who's sitting here, I'm the one that's going to be ripping you new toys, which means I'm going to be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason that's up there, apart from to elicit a reaction, is I was talking to one of the friends on uh, one of the anonymous sites, and he was like, oh yeah, you got to put shit like that in. So it's in. And it's on video. <laughs> My mother's going to watch this. And she, I'll get the... Christopher? Yes, mother. <laughs> All right, so... Let's do a case study. We'll talk about deception for a second, because I promised we'd talk about deception, because I think it's in the bloody... Uh, that was a motorbike. That was a good one. Sorry, squirrel moment. <laughs> this is why I have squirrels in here. Um, all right, so case de deception. OK, we think of deception, most of us probably think of deception as the old honeypots. They were great. They stuck out like a shining beacon. You'd scan a network and be like, oh, it's a well, you wouldn't even scan the damn network. It'd be sitting there go, look at me. I'm a honeypot. I'm a honeypot. 
you're sitting in this sea of Windows 7 machines and there's a Windows XP machine going, I'm a honeypot, I'm a honeypot. fuck it, I'm going to leave the damn thing alone. This stuff, I mean, it went out of mainstream. It's still supported by a freaking amazing active community. I cannot say enough about all of those guys. But we didn't use it. Why? Because we fixated on those sodding firewalls, which are useless. I'm not saying burn the firewall, because that would be fun, but it would be foolish. But I am saying give it some bloody help. So we need to change it. We've got to reinvent it with the criteria I just yelled at everybody about. And we've got to make it effective. And we've got to make it preventative. This is Honeypot version 1. Great idea, good science experiment, really didn't stop shit. So we talk about high interaction versus low interaction. Quite simply, low interaction is like, hi, ooh, great, I've got you. End of discussion. That's, sorry, that's not high, that's low. Brain's gone to sleep. Low interaction is I poke it, it sends an alert one direction and sends me back a header. That shit's easy. The high interaction is where a couple of the companies are going, oh, we've got to have a rack full of gear. Bullshit. Find a different way of doing it. There's all sorts of really nice tunnels and virtualizations and VNICs and all sorts of fun things that you can do that. You can have both if somebody would take the bloody time to do it properly. I can have autonomous auto interaction with the attacker. When I put this thing in my environment, I shouldn't have to tell it what the hell I want it to be. If I drop it in a sea of Linux boxes, it should be able to go, hmm, I've got that, and I've got Red Hat, I've got Debian, I've, okay, I'm going to be a couple of each. It won't go, well, bollocks to this, I'm just going to be Windows, because that's what I was told to be. It should automate that. It should deliver banners, it should deliver pages. This is simple stuff. We should basically have the high interaction Alice in Wonderland on demand. As a consumer, I want it. I'm taking the American. I just want it. Figure out how to bloody well do it. It's easy to do. Don't come to me and tell me, well, I've only got a point solution that does low interaction only. Well, bullshit. Simple stuff. The concepts, the flexibility. All of these things are easy. When I do detection and I do engagement, hopefully you control and you know what's in your environment. I'd argue some of you might not know what's in your environment. But as a partner, our job is to make your life a lot easier. It's not to introduce more toys that you have to watch, more technology you have to worry about, and more systems that I'm going to use as a point of compromise. Whatever solution you put in needs to be adaptive. Some of you guys might want to do research. You don't want to kill it as soon as it results. If I'm in your network and I basically run into one of these man traps, do you want to kill me? Do you want to monitor me? Or do you want to bring me into Alice in Wonderland? Those are choices you can make, but those are things that this thing should be able to do. Why can't we build that? Same thing with owning the enterprise. You're the one that should be dictating the solutions, not the other way around. You shouldn't have to change your enterprise to fit somebody's frickin' security solution that's not built properly. Couldn't help it. A little bit of fun. <laughs> All right, I'm going to run through these because I've got five minutes before I get yelled at. So the whole other thing as well. If I put a solution in place, it shouldn't sit there and tap its foot and wait around and go, well, nobody's talking to me, therefore I'm going to ignore everybody. Sod the lot of you. You should have tendrils and tentacles everywhere. The whole concept of lures and breadcrumbs. If I've built deception properly, I should be like the Greek sirens, singing to every sodding hacker that's close by, going, ah, look what I've got, I've got some... I will not show my leg because they're hairy. <laughs> you get the idea. It should be alerting. It should help you understand your environment. And he should better choose the response. This is simple stuff. This is how an attacker should view your bloody network. Behind half of those doors, it will find reality. Behind the other half of the doors, there are traps, lures, and people like me waiting to smack it upside the head. Tell me which one is which. You shouldn't know the difference. And that's what pisses me off about most of deception these days as it says there. Should have intelligent conversation. This is like a dating site. It should basically say, hey, 
wants to play hard, wants to come. It's all the good things that should be built in, in the same way that we converse as humans. These systems should be able to do the same thing. When you deploy tools, they should help you understand your environment. They should help you learn what you need to do. You shouldn't have to tell them all of your problems. They should come to you and go, hey, I've seen this. This is what I recommend. And when it comes to reporting, God forbid if the stupid thing doesn't actually do it properly. Take it out, burn it. Send the video to the vendor. Should live anywhere you need it. The cloud, the premise, it should scale. This is great. I just spent the last four days dealing with raspberries, bananas, pineapples, oranges, the pie family, for want of a better way of putting it, and odroids. Those are fun little beasties. It should have everything covered. If I want to deploy it in my corporate environment and add in my skater and IoT environment, it should cover me. This is how it should look. You guys probably recognize that. That's the SEAL, it's like one of the SEAL recruiting videos. It's like find the SEALs. That's how deception should be. We've given it the legs to come into this century kicking ass and taking names to use a colloquialism. So why the hell are we handling it? Why are we not doing it properly? If we do this right, if we build deception right, if we build the architecture and the methodology right, it isn't just deception. As we move into the stuff that you're building in the next five years, the nanotech architecture in the next five, 10, 15, 20 years, we have to make it a lot bleaker for the attackers. We're not doing that. Honeypot's one way, back with a vengeance. It doesn't sit on the bloody network. It doesn't just sit in two different flavors. It doesn't just have too many open ports and look stupid. It actually does what the hell it needs to do. So, with that, we will slowly wrap up. As a red team, as somebody who gets to break into companies for a living, physically and electronically, I have a plea as you design and you develop and you encode and you do the things that you do well, stop putting default passwords in place. Stop putting default passwords on GitHub, on JetBrain, on Oracle forums, on other forums. I watch them, I see them, I don't want to see any more, please. Don't share crappy keys to the password description we had earlier. Get some intelligence in there. I want a challenge. Typically, we're into an organization, big, small, or indifferent, by lunchtime on day one. Give me a challenge. And as the blue team, they don't want more screens to look at. They sure as hell don't need the users to find even more insecure ways to work. They want something intuitive, and quite honestly, they need help. They need something simple, because they are simple, because we like our users. And make it for everybody. When you design something, design it with the masses in mind. Don't just put a point solution in place. Think about how and where else it can be used. Start taking a look at it for the enterprise. Take it for the OS and Android. I don't know how many bloody products I look at. They're like, oh, Android only. I want to phone the developer up, find out where they live, and do nasty things to them, their pets, and their family. And if you really, really have to, you probably should make it for bloody Windows as well. Only if you have to only because I'm banned from the campus. <laughs> I did nasty things to Xbox a few years ago. <laughs> the data, as you architect, as you design, as you build, take a look at where you're putting the data, how you're putting the data, what you are doing with the data. So, I'm wrapping up and I'm hitting my time. I think I'm actually hitting it just right. So I'll give thanks again. Obviously, the Acavio team for letting me cause chaos and mayhem around this place. A huge thanks for the guys at Absec California put a, putting on a freaking kick-ass conference by the looks of it. I only got it spent after that, and the munchies today as well. Obviously, Edward, thank you, you can blame him. And the other chaps down here for letting me loose on stage. To everybody who was here, thank you very much for hearing me out and having chaos and mayhem. Squirrels, polar bears, airbag seals, and Eddie Mize as well, as everybody. So, last slide. Thank you very, very, very much, everybody. Go forth, get presents, and get alcohol. Thank you.
Yeah.